happy to introduce Professor Jenny Murray from Georgia Tech to my colleagues at ICT. Personally, I've known her for many years as she was my former advisor for my master's program at Georgia Tech. And David Crum was also student, but dif in different program back then. And <laughs> we had a chance for reunion um, at SIGHI conference last year in Atlanta. And we talked about our most recent project and Jenny showed a big um, interest in the project that you guys are doing here. And she's been here um, before and we have a good relationship with her, the students. And some of our students um, were just step before me and came here as an intern also. And John Grouch also suggested to share her work with um, ICTRs, so now she, here she is. Uh -huh. Needless to say, she's an internationally recognized uh, interactive designer and the author of the book Hamlet on the Holodeck, and most recently has been named one of the top 10 <laughs> brains of the digital future, <laughs> along with um, Harry Jenkins and Tim Bonas Lee by an expert panel of the um, Prospect magazine. So I'm very honored to introduce her to you guys, and let's welcome Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and for having me. I'm so excited to see the, the demos here and to talk with all of you. Um, and of course, it's a great pleasure to see Sinwa and to see how she's uh, blossomed into this uh, fellow professional from being my research assistant. You were my first research assistant when I first went to Georgia Tech in 99, um, right? Or 2000, the next year? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's wonderful. Um, so, um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the main headline big ideas of my forthcoming book, Inventing the Medium. And I'm going to try to give you enough of them to argue with me about them. Uh, and I I'm, I'm, uh, wanted, uh, I, I brought pen and paper to take furious notes on, uh, on your comments. So, uh, so, uh, uh, um, so I will. Uh, I need to be interrupted, though, so I don't talk <laughs> too long, and um, and not leave enough time for questions. Okay. So inventing the medium. Um, this is when I did Hamlet on the holodeck. I uh, I the idea was to prove to myself that this was a, a, an environment in which you could have strong, rich, creative expression that would rival literary expression or filmic expression. And, um, uh, and, in, when, and in chapter three of that book, I set myself the task of saying, well, if that's the case, if it's like film, then it has properties of that are unique ju and just as we learn to cut the film and to focus the camera there must be characteristic properties of this medium and then and I came up with four characteristic properties which I'll be talking about which uh, then became useful to me not just in making the argument that for storytelling, which is what Hamlet on the Holodeck was about, but just as a designer in general. I was at MIT and I was designing educational projects, uh, and, and it became a good reference point. So, um, uh, and since then I've been teaching design in a graduate program focused on digital media at Georgia Tech. Uh, and so this book captures that approach to thinking about how do we know it's a good one? Okay. So this is a real problem with making something in digital environments because unlike making a toaster, which is the classic design problem, it, we don't have a, an example often of what it is that we're making. If you're making a toaster, you refine a to the existing affordances and features of the toaster. And you might get a new material like ceramics, or you might come up 
with a playful design uh, from an artistic point of view that the toast is, pro is projected onto the plate. Um, but you, <laughs> you really, basically, we know what toast is. And we know when it succeeds and fails. We know, and we know what the things we hate about toasters are, which people actually don't seem to be able to master well enough. Uh, you still have to fight to get the bagel out, right? <laughs> so, uh, but that, but it's about it's a pretty known thing. And similarly, if you think about media tasks, we know in, for some more mature media that. Uh, what a sitcom is, for instance, what the genres are. So if uh, once we have I Love Lucy or Father Knows Best, then we can vary it in, a, in revolutionary ways to include this uh, subversive content of all in the family, or we can include black people, or we could push the boundaries with uh, modern family. Uh, uh, in the same way to have different kinds of social material, but we still know they'll be the same people, they'll love each other, they'll act, the kooky ones will act kooky, the exasperated ones will be exasperated, and we know what the job, if you show up every day to make a sitcom, you don't have to say to yourself, what is a sitcom? And you don't have to tell your audience what a sitcom is. So we don't have that luxury as the designers in uh, the digital medium uh, because the things that are made of bits are changing all the time. And some of the platform innovations are uh, dictated by commercial calculations or rivalries and, and, uh, that, and some it's hard to tell which ones are going to be the ones that will take off or what to expect in the short term. Um, for instance, looking at the, uh, the iPad, which has been so successful, and, uh, which is so frustrating in so many interesting ways. You know, basically a jumbo phone without the phone, right? Who would think that this was going to be great or that you'd have the... Um, the notepad without the stylus that you couldn't actually write with. Uh, but then when people get it, all of a sudden it absorbs all of this content. But then when it absorbs all this content, it becomes a good media viewer, it does it in the ways that, uh, that are very dependent on the legacy environment. So you don't have all of the affordances of searching and, and juxtaposing that we expect out of a computational environment. So it's very hard to give people the right level of expectation. And you don't have, for instance, an operating system, which drives me crazy. Uh, or if you, if you try to read on the Kindle, it has portability, it has capacity, but it really, uh, uh, so you can't actually uh, write on it the way you could pencil and paper. So you lose those affordances. So it's very hard to tell what the, uh, what the stable genres are and how to tell users what the stable genres are. And of course, if you're making things in, uh, for uh, uh, the equivalent of the holodeck, then you can, we can master the technologies of getting a lot of the information, but then there's not, there isn't one clear outcome that you can aim for so that, and if you're doing it with a multidisciplinary team, perhaps you've noticed here, it's certainly true at other places, that people come with very different ideas of what a good one consists of. So what a visual person thinks is good is very different from an interaction person or a programmer. Uh, and how do you decide? I, I used to say very often, if it's, is it a toaster or a poster? You know, those are very different environments. Uh, and often the, the design values are not uh, well formed. So you, could just, so you can say something visually is clean, but that's a negative value. How do you design for negatives? Like make it nonlinear, make it clean. Those, those, are, those are the things that might be most salient to us. And I guess we know when it's linear and we know when it's cluttered. But 
it's very hard to say what is clean enough. Uh, or or uh, that for linear, I prefer multi-sequential and unisequential, so that you, you have the sense of well-formed sequences, but not just one. Um, so we're struggling to come up with these. And so one way that, uh, so when I went to write this book about inventing the medium, I realized that I had these four affordances, and somebody else would have just stuck with that and, and published the book, say, you know, five, ten years earlier than me. But I realized that I had to rethink what I meant by medium, uh, because that is a very mushy word that people are, uh, are not clear about. And so, and I think that it's important to separate out the parts of a medium. So a medium it, is composed of inscription, of making a mark that's lasting and perceptible in some way, and then of, on top of those marks, those shared perceptions, we develop these transmission codes that are socially agreed upon, like the alphabet or the protocols that, that underlie the internet. And that sends those codes back and forth. But the reason why it's of, and we're constant, so, and we're seeing innovation at the transmission codes, we're, and at the transmission technologies, and we're seeing innovation at the inscription. Uh, and we're seeing inscription of, of the, by the people making the artifacts, and then the people, since it's interactive, there's an inscription process in, in navigating uh, and acting with the artifact. So all of those things are disruptive, are disrupted. And, and, and I think people get confused in design situations about which they're dealing with. And they often will re-inscribe re uh, um, the legacy patterns from a previous inscription technology on to a new one, uh, so, uh, and then judge it by those terms. So we'll say, we call web pages pages, but pages are not semantic uh, divisions. So we should forget about the page, and we should think about something else that's a, a unit of meaning. OK. So, um, uh, so the thing that gives it inscription, transmission, but the, the, the real payoff is in the representation, is that we take these codes and then we share a, a, an understanding of what they stand for. So we can interpret the alphabet as a set of sounds, and then we can interpret those sounds as words, and we can interpret those words as referring to things in the world and things in our heads that we share. And in order to get to this level, we have to establish shared conventions and then lump those things together into genres. And when those conventions and genres are well aligned with a reasonably stable transmission and inscription pattern, then uh, we get a genre, uh, a, a format that, that's lasting, like the sitcom, or for the time being, iTunes and, and uh, the, uh, the iPad. Um, so that's what we're always going for. And so this is when I say that design is a cultural task. It's good to, or when you're trying to decide what's the right values to apply to a design, I find it helpful to have this common orientation, that we're involved in a collective effort, and all of us together are trying to invent these stable genres. That where we have conventions that we share, where our users, our interactors, know what to expect of those conventions, and where we can build these more expressive structures on top of one another. But we also want to keep expanding, though we don't want to freeze them, we want to keep expanding and refining the palette so that we can express more and more. Um, so the question that this, uh, and, and, and in thinking about this, I find it useful. Uh, I've been showing these for a while, but they're very orienting for me to think about um, the, uh, the, the historically visible path that we've gone from uh, the invention of the machinery of the uh, film 
into the rich expressiveness of, of movies. So here's the uh, arrival of the train. It's a Ciutat station. I'm sure most people here are familiar with it, right? Uh, and this is it pretty much in its entirety. Uh, and so there we get the technology for film. There's motion. Um, oops. But if you look at this fast bound, oh, if you look at this uh, excerpt about the same length, oops, from a fast bounder film, Effie Breast, Breast. Look at how much narrative information is conveyed in that same event, getting off a train, focusing on these particular characters. Because this is fiction, and the other was documenting the world. But look at how we learned in those 70 years to set up an enormous amount of expectations in the viewer, even not having seen this film, the relationship between the two characters, the importance of this meaning, the moment, the reluctance, the sense of the arrival, all from uh, having invented the tracking shot uh, and uh, the particular kind of film acting, the racking focus. There's a lot of, of uh, inventions of semantic techniques that get you from one to the other. And I think of this moment in, from a film made in 1905, The Great Train Robbery, one of the beginnings of the great cowboy uh, uh, genre, which I know you guys are working with too, as showing how we invent it. So it's hard to predict what are going to be the right conventions. But as, cons as designers, but as consumers, we always know when we see it what we want more of. And then we be immediately become pati impatient with anything that doesn't have it. Right. So there's going to be a moment in just right here. This is another very short clip. But already, so we're impatient from our view of film to watch this, because not enough is happening here that we can focus on. There it goes. <laughs> OK. So it, you know, the energy level goes up when, when the guy comes into a, a medium shot focus there in front of the camera when there's one actor. And then we see that he's doing too much with his hands, that he's still in 19th century acting mode from, from being visible on a stage, and that we, he, we, haven't, we haven't invented film acting yet. But, but we know that we want one person, and we want him close to the camera. So we go from a stationary camera at a fixed event where they're just in love with the spectacle because you couldn't get a train and all these people on the stage. You can imagine how they must have thought, this is going to be really cool. We'll get all these people. We'll get this train. Uh, but then watching it, 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 it uh, maybe the first people to watch it felt cool. But as soon as they saw that, they wanted more of that. They wanted more things happening closer to the camera, individual actors. And then with just the establishing shots. So, um, uh, and I was accused, when I make that kind of argument, my colleagues who do games, sometimes their feelings get hurt. Uh, like the entire nation of Finland, I believe, had its feelings hurt on this. But that as if I was saying, they're too primitive. We've got a hundred years before games are worthy of expressiveness, and that's not the case. That you can have, even in an early medium, you can have works that are perfect in themselves, like the the arrival of the train at Seattle Station or the Great Train Robbery are perfect in themselves, but they're of their time. Uh, Donkey Kong is great. Uh, Pac-Man, you could not improve upon Pac-Man. It's perfect. Uh, but I mean that very seriously. Uh, but, um, uh, and also, you can build these more expressive objects, uh, like the uh, way Fassbinder builds Epi Breeze's 
it's that moment uh, based on these other moments. So uh, the, the experimental game Braid reflects back on Donkey Kong in the same way. Uh, and it's about the passage of time and regret over love affairs. And, and uh, so you, you can, once you have clear shared conventions, they're available for building on. And that's what we always have to look for, are those clear shared conventions that focus our shared attention, which is what uh, a medium does. Okay. So given that, we have to think about what is the design space in which we make representation. And these are the four affordances of uh, the computers that I came up with in chapter three of Hamlet on the holodeck uh, that I have found useful for general design problems. Uh, and of course, you could just make do with, the, with procedurality and participation because the spatial property is based, it's not based on the visual aspects of the computer. It's based upon the fact that it's acting with rules and that it responds consistently so that we can cognitively create space. So Zork was spatial with just words. You didn't have to draw a picture in order to create that space. Uh, and encyclopedic has to do with the capacity. So a lot of the, um, and we've had other, compa we've had other um, uh, capacious, uh, large media, like uh, print, is a, is a much larger palette for capturing uh, information than handwriting was. Film captures more information than, uh, uh, and different kinds of information than we could with still photography or um, uh, painting or words. Um, so, uh, so the, the right in here is where a lot of the novelty is. So, and this is a way that you can think about how different products position themselves. So, what was powerful about Google is that it really uh, had the smartest algorithms, and it it addressed this encyclopedic space. And I and I don't think I maybe should extend it a little more in the participatory because it leveraged the uh, the notes that people, uh, the words that people use at, at, within the link and the knowledge of who was linking in order to refine that search. So that's not just a programming advantage. That is saying, I know that these are human beings affecting this environment. And they were, they were just, uh, smart enough to see that. But that was the original Google. You can see that <laughs> in its uh, success, it looks something like this. And, it, and then you notice that I didn't put any cars on here. I think that might be like outside of their success. Uh, but maybe it's part of the spatial. I don't know. But they then looked at the ways in which that power of procedurality and that, uh, s that scope of encyclopedic reference that they were the masters of could extend to these other domains. Um, whereas for Wikipedia, the procedural is less important. The spatial, my students were just arguing with me when I showed the slide. It really, they use the information space brilliantly. So I think maybe I should give them some more room uh, on that quadrant. Uh, Flickr, I don't think is going to be around too long. I think it is kind of uh, lame and that uh, it's not organized enough in the encyclopedic dimension. Uh, but it's a way, and, and similarly, that so uh, there might be too little pr procedural power behind um, uh, Second Life. And people might get that spatial and participatory out of Facebook. So they might not need the large overhead of um, so it's one way of thinking about things. It, it's also a way of thinking about starting an application. So you might, the, here are some of the obvious uh, genres and strategies that we have at our disposal in ex existing formats, existing genres, that 
if we're going to say take music players, we could think about, well, how do we bring these encyclopedic or database, or how do we bring a virtual landscape into thinking about a new, uh, new environment? Or we could look at um, the existing applications in this space and see how music is, uh, is instantiated across a lot of applications using this grid. So it's, it's different from saying, what are the existing features, and then checking off a competitive analysis. This is saying the entire affordances of the digital are available to any application. And we may decide to situate it in this little cozy corner or that one, but we should think about it as living in this other space. Uh, because it will develop cousins over the next few years in those spaces, and they might uh, supersede, or just because we have this other expressivity available to us. Uh, and then another way of thinking about it is to just look, and, and I, I encourage my students, to go to the core human experience abstracted from any devices, old or new, and just say to yourself, music. How do I experience music? How do people I know experience music? How does that relate to space? How does that relate to, to community? How does that relate to collecting? And, and then think, OK, given that, what are the affordances that match that? That, that? I think that is a crucial part of design, which is often overlooked, is instead of trying to replicate legacy environments, or instead of falling in love with the novelty of what you can do in the technology, to go back to the core human experience how, that people have done uh, for uh, as far back as you can think of, uh, and say, what are the shapes that that takes? And then fit that to the affordances. Okay. So um, and in thinking about these uh, four affordances, I, and that this I had figured out in Hamlet on the Holodeck, Chapter 3, is that the spatial and the encyclopedic are what make up immersion. That sense that we can, that things are, uh, uh, have tremendous extent. So there's a sense of immersion of experience, that of boundarylessness, but actually that comes from knowing very well where the boundaries are and trusting those boundaries so that you can step in them and you won't see the holodeck grid uh, appear and to disrupt the immersion. You have to have the cooperation, especially in an interactive environment. And then, but then the encyclopedia, the sense of depth. And you can have that sense of immersion in an information space or in an entertainment uh, or um, uh, simulated world space. Uh, and then interactivity, I think, is a very, youth, uh, very mushy design word, um, and uh, I like to use a, a, the word agency instead uh, for, the, for the for good. That interactivity is made up of the procedural and the participatory be coupling together well. So that what the machine does and what the human does gives the human the experience of agency. Um. Okay, and when and some people think that interactivity, which uh, you know uh, they usually use a sloppier word, and immersion are uh, are um, and especially in Hollywood they tend to think this. Perhaps perhaps you've run across this uh, that they're contradictory, but actually they reinforce one another. That the more you give people ways of grabbing things and trying things and using things in the inter in the uh, procedural world, and the more that world responds to what you do, the, um, the more you believe in it, and the more immersed you are. And the more immersed you are, the more you think of things you want to do. So you want to set up that virtuous cycle going. Um, OK. So um, now I'm going to. Uh, just skip and briefly mention four ways of thinking 
about how, given that grid of the four different um, uh, affordances of the whole medium, the participatory one, you know, we have a lot of strategies in HCI for, for gauging participation and, and measuring people. But in thinking more uh, culturally about design, um, uh, which is compatible with these other approaches, um, I, I find it useful to think about our task as scripting the interactor. We know that we script, we code the machine to do things. But the question is, how do we tell the participating human what to expect in the environment so that they have the right level of expectation, they know what to do, and then they can get the experience of agency. Um, and I think that, and I, I in my uh, book, um, it's meant to be used as a, a textbook, but also as a kind of a thought experiment refresher for practicing designers. Uh, I, I uh, suggest there's four important models that are implicit in the design process. So the, uh, the tool model, I've, I've, uh, the uh, machine model, which I imagine is widgets, the, the companion model, which I think you very bravely are approaching uh, here, and which is a very um, uh, a charge, very difficult one. And then the game model, which one might argue underlies all of interaction. Um, so I'm going to just briefly say some things about that. And um, then I, I'll show you uh, something that uh, we're making in my ETB lab, uh, and then we'll have time for questions. So, um, so the, um, there's a lot to be said about tools, uh, and we know a lot of the principles of direct manipulation. A, a lot about um, uh, why the tool is a really good model for us has to do with the expressive power of the hand. And we're really at this fascinating moment, and I know you guys have been experimenting with the Kinect system, where we're sort of losing the, uh, the artifact and trying to get as much as we can out of the gesture of the hand. That the tool is the, uh, the virtual uh, tool that, that, that's in the machine, the thing that we're, that's, that's responding to us when, when we make the gestures. Um, so uh, one uh, concept that I talk about with relation to tools that I, I thought might be a useful term for you guys uh, is the idea of a threshold object. That having something in your hand that has reality in this world and that then leads you into the next world is a, uh, a wonderful way of achieving the transparency, the goal of uh, the design goal that maps with tools, I believe, is transparency. So the, um, the to achieve transparency in a uh, in a an immersive uh, virtual reality or augmented reality environment is very difficult because you have to signal to people what you don't have the fourth wall to tell they're in the room. So how do they know what's hot and what's not? So having objects that have reality in here, uh, but that then lead you into the world, I think is really good. And this is a project that was done by colleagues of mine, Blair McIntyre and Jay Bolter at, um, uh, at Georgia Tech um, uh, years ago. Um, and uh, um, uh, the student's name was Eugene Marino. Um, the, uh, uh, to, to, uh, um, to put people in the Alice in Wonderland environment. So you're given a teacup, and you see your fellow, uh, you see the, your images projected. You're sitting at a real table. You're given a teacup. And you can throw tea. There's no liquid in the cup. But you can throw tea at the Mad Hatter, and they respond appropriately. Uh, and having that teacup focuses the kinds of things you might expect to do, gives you a gesture that is, has dramatic compression to it. It's limited. 
uh, and that is capturable. So I think looking for those things, I think that's part of our collective job, is coming up with that palette of gestures that map onto these, these threshold objects. Um, I think that uh, for the machine, we now have so many actions that are a black box uh, that we're in danger, as in World of Warcraft, of making the, the, inter the, the control panel into the game <laughs> and making the game action secondary to the control panel. And uh, we can make uh, control panels at uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, you know, is, uh, is uh, proof of that. People can find dice and tables of numbers really uh, uh, sexy and full of adventure. But I think that we have to get to a place where we make, um, where we have some common uh, controls that don't take as much overload in order to, um, to operate them. And I think this is also true in the information space, that we're moving from having a lot of different widgets. So uh, I think that what Donald, when Donald Lumer predicted appliances, I think he was partly right. I don't think we need a separate device for everything. I think the Kindle and the, the uh, iPad are doomed if they don't become more like computers. But I think we need software appliances that then talk to each other, that then can display the same information and send it back and forth in XML and semantic ways so that uh, they know about each other. Um, so, um, so the visibility, because we have to have a control where the visibility of what is in that black box is clear and where the parameters can be very directly manipulated. Uh, there's too many things that we deal with uh, at this point that we don't know what they're going to do. You know, if I do a map quest, I can't get it to tell me how to get there without highways uh, uh, unless I use one, you know, I can't do it on, on all the systems. So we need to have control over all of those parameters. Okay, so now we get to one that I think would be particularly of interest to you guys, which is um, the companionship model. So ever since... Um, uh, people started thinking of computers, they started thinking of robots and thinking of them as somehow animated. And Nicholas Negroponte and uh, the Knowledge Navigator video are canonical examples of Nicholas Negroponte and the idea of the, the valet, the perfect English uh, valet. Uh, and then the Knowledge Navigator with the bow tie. Uh, so we have this, and then the very uh, ill-fated S. Jeeves. Well, they exemplified, which was based upon those, those ideas, the idea, and I think that the iPod captured it appropriately, that there is this present. You see how she's standing there as if she's dancing with somebody? There's somebody in there. It's not just that machine. There's, there's some uh, uh, perfect love object that she's, she's, uh, she's getting something from <laughs> here, that she's in that trance. Um, and you know how people think about the iPod, that it knows your mood, it's trying to encourage me. Um, we have this notion that the machine is this magical companion that thinks and knows us and anticipates uh, what we do. And so that's why we get so angry when it directs us in the wrong way uh, or plays a song that we thought, knew that we didn't like playing. Uh, because we have this irrational belief that it is animated. Um, and I think that, it, that um, in thinking about how we relate, to these characters, we, we have to remember that, w that the, as users, as interactors, we will al always think about the machine as animated and as being a consciousness in some way. So we have to be very careful about how we trigger that. When we use natural language processing, we raise the level of expectation through the roof. So it's much more likely that people are going to get angry at us because we're going to fail. Um, so, uh, and I think that people see most of these, most of these devices and, and um, helping systems, recommendation systems, uh, and these um, 
uh, things like our mail that are so uh, intimately part of our daily process is somewhere along this continuum. And, and I'm not saying that mail is, the mail things are always evil. I put it there because in my book I have an example of, uh, of Google not letting me, Google Mail not letting me delete things. Okay, so when, when it's organizing all my mail into uh, threads, I, then I feel, oh, it's my reliable, helpful companion. But when it won't let me delete my mail, then I think it's, this is evil. It's serving its own purposes. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, uh, Microsoft Bob is the incarnation of evil. Uh, but, and people keep making that same mistake. They keep thinking that it's going to be better if we personify. And it actually, we should always, we should all have little, little pictures of Microsoft Bob and Jeeves up in our our office because it's not going to make it better. Um, but we still have that ballet. See, that's why I put Jeeves over there. People still evoke that sense of the magical servant uh, as, uh, as if it were possible. Um, and I think that this is a much safer area to aim for, is this one. Um. Where, where it, we direct it, and it does what we tell it to do. Uh, I think that uh, there's fewer examples of success in the other direction, but we can discuss that. Um, and I think maybe I'll skip over the game model and talk about it some other time, because um, everything's game. But let me show you um, uh, this one example, just so I can share. Um, so this, so I think one of, we've been, lo we've been looking at the iPad in my uh, ETV lab um, as a uh, navigation environment. Um, and this is a uh, project um, that came out of, um, uh, uh, a, a, a master's project at Georgia Tech. Um, oh, okay. Let me just, uh, and this is on my ETV um, website. You can look at it and you can see my graduate student, Sergio Goldenberg, and hear him talk about it. So this was a master's project. Uh, okay, I'm stopping right now. Uh, that uh, has multiple versions of the same night. And the question is how, if you make things into a game because of uh, that uh, environment that allows us to capture parameterized scenarios, which I think is one of the great promises of this medium, how do you navigate them so that people don't get confused? And so this is an example, which I invite you to look at, of, of a interface that we became satisfied with for uh, for changing the parameters so that instead of having a branching story where you have to go back and retrace things, you can juxtapose parallel uh, uh, segments at, uh, uh, at any le by changing parameters from before uh, or any other part of the story. Um, so, um, and that. So, um, uh, that's all I have <laughs> to say, uh, and I want to hear you. Okay. So I hope I said enough things that people could disagree with me in interesting ways. If you need to talk more things, um, <laughs> yeah, well, I'd rather have more time, too. Okay. So if you have, um, asked, uh, if you have a question, time to ask a question today? Yeah.
Yes. But uh, you know, like, it's really like quite a big era, these uh, virtual environments that immerse you in a fictional place. If you don't have you know, uh, realism of interaction with the characters, then you end up only with these, you know, these fictional environments that are populated by Roombas instead of people. Yeah. And, uh, so right. Right. So, uh, so the question. Uh, so, I would say, I, I, yes, I agree with you that we can't have rum the rumbas. Although people do interpret the rumba very richly as a a character, as a presence, a companion in the house. But if you want to tell a story, you have to have characters in the story. Uh, but when you use the word realism, then I get worried. Because, and I think that this is a mistake that, um, uh, that uh, AI people have made, uh, but that Joe Bates corrected when he said, no, we don't want realistic characters. We want believable characters. So what you have to do is find that sweet spot of dramatic compression. Um, and I think that that is why facade, uh, which I think is one of the great achievements, of procedurality at, in interactive fiction. How many people are familiar with that? I don't you know. Michael Matias says, brilliant interactive drama, but it uses in natural language processing, is that it doesn't, um, uh, by letting people, trying for realism, freedom of input, uh, interrupting at any moment, that it doesn't shape the interaction enough. Whereas, in a, in a dramatic scene, there's usually, and even in discourse, there's usually turn taking. So we have to look for the places where, um, uh, where we can impose abstraction systems that script the interactor into having limited expectations. Um, we don't expect in any, in a, in a uh, NCIS episode that people are going to, uh, uh, that aliens are going to come. Uh, so, uh, but if in, uh, we might think that in um, the X-Files that there might be an alien. You know, so we have to, uh, so when we say realism, you're saying in real life anything can happen. So the question for story is how you, you have these limited scenarios. How do you make a scenario that has dramatic compression, but is still parameterized in some way. That's what I see as the, as the design challenge. Is that, yeah? Yeah. I like your remarks about, uh, about immersion uh, and uh, interactivity or, or agency. And another term that we sometimes uh, throw around around here is Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how you see that relating to those other, those other ideas. So engagement would be um, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, do, do you use it as flow? Do you measure it? Or do you, or is it, cause, or is it the preliminary experience of it's the really attractor? The way I think yeah. we often Also, uh, it's a function of interactivity, um, and, and, and so I see it as kind of a, a, a layer on top of those, of those two ideas. And, and yeah. Well, I guess. Uh, I guess I, yes, I would say that's true. But I guess I would think I would think a close, uh, like a finer grained way of looking at it might be to think about it as the uh, possibility space in the per the mind of the interactor, if they're engaged. It's because they see possibilities in the, uh, in the things they can manipulate. They, they, every one of the four affordances has a level of expectation. So we go to anything digital, we expect it to be, we have encyclopedic expectations, it has everything. Uh, we have procedural expectations that it knows, you know, it'll do things. 
Uh, and we always have these participatory expectations that we can manipulate, we can do something. So engagement, I guess I would think, might, one might think of it as uh, how you are, so that you would know what you were designing, how to design for engagement, would be are there things that, uh, that script the interactor into specific actions and then set up a rich possibility space of things that might happen um, at, pro at different levels, perhaps. Um, if you have uh, a key, then there's expectations there'll be a door. But if it's in a treasure hunt, then there's expectations there'll be you know, a treasure box that we'll go to. So what are, so engagement has to do with your sense that there are these expectations. And then the interactivity, uh, th then you have to build agency into the things that the engagement um, elicits, the act actions the engagement elicits, I would say. Uh, yeah, I think that'd be useful, Karen. Nobody wants to argue with me about it? Oh, well, you argue. Yeah, uh-huh. So, with the machine modeling that's going to get the low workup. Uh, yeah. Is that true? I mean, the way, the way I deal with it is I spend more time interacting with people, and I feel like, like I basically I By voice. I'm sorry? By voice over the, um, or so by action, coordinating actions, or? It can be either. I mean, I would say just going forward with text and games, and just coordinating emotions and emotions. Um, but I just, I can't really see how you could get so much detail with any technology that you have. Yeah. So this is the same argument that people make uh, about Photoshop, which is it's just so complicated, it has to be a nightmare to use. But I guess I, without being an expert you know, user of either of them, I believe that in both cases there will be higher levels of organization. Um, so that there'd be better classification, there'd be better categorization, there'd be, um, uh, maybe we'll just learn to encapsulate uh, whole sequences of actions in some way. Um, I think what you said about um, uh, the, uh, the pleasure, um, so that was actually my point about uh, games. Uh, is that, and, and I think it goes for Farmville as well as World of Warcraft, though they're very different, is that uh, because, you know, it's a great controversy, why do people like Farmville so annoying to people who, who design more complex games? People like to be synchronized with other people. And that has been one of our big survival values. If, uh, if you think about media, uh, as symbolic representation of any kind, starting with language. How did we ever come to the ability to agree that this means, you know, go there? Because we are born with this uh, joy in recognizing that our uh, species mates have minds like ours and that we can echo each other's minds. And so that is what a game is. Um, so that's when you say, well, what I'm really into is this other thing. And, uh, and I think that's an interesting research topic, is what is the relationship of all of these gizmos <laughs> to affording what people, well, you know, like why aren't people just calling each other on the phone or something? Is it? But maybe it's, it's, it has to do with affiliation. The C, you know, it's why people like Emacs. Uh, perhaps even people in this room, I hope not. But, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> or why Mac users hate uh, PC users. You know, it's that I know the secret codes, and you know the secret codes. So you know, we're, we're both jets, you know? Like, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the complexity, maybe it's not a bug. I guess if I were designing these things, I'd be tempted to say, no, it's a feature. People like the complexity because <laughs> it builds the affiliation. But, but as somebody with the taking, zooming out on our common job to make a, an environment that makes us all collectively smarter and collectively more knit together, I think we want to see less of that in some way. Yeah. We want to see it in the service of, of, ever, of more encapsulation of, of past.